One of the tools that you'll be using the most while painting is the color selector. I prefer to use the artistic color selector set to the HSI or HSY modes because they better represent natural color, but there are others to choose from like the classic HSV mode. The artistic color selector features a circle that allows you to select a pure color, blue, yellow, red, magenta, green, and so on, along with the saturation or intensity of the color. Currently I am using the HSI color mode, so on the left is a strip that shows the value or brightness of the color. If I choose the wide gamut color selector, this is closer to what you'd see in most other art apps. Now the hue is on the outer ring and the saturation and brightness are expressed in a diamond shape. Moving left to right controls the saturation, and up and down controls the brightness. It's also possible to control hue, saturation, and brightness with individual sliders. Moving the sliders also affects the color selector, so if I move the hue slider, you can see the hue ring moving in response. I can also use the saturation slider to make the color more vibrant or more muted. The third slider controls the brightness, which can be used to make the color lighter or darker. And the fourth slider controls both the saturation and brightness together to get a more natural lightening or darkening. You can preview the color you have selected in the color swatch in the top left of the color selector. In order to select a color, you can follow my three-step process. First, think about the hue of the color you want. If I were going to paint a daytime sky, then I'd choose a color somewhere in between indigo and cyan. Step two is to decide how light or dark I want the sky to be. I'll choose a blue that's bright. For step three, I will decide how saturated to make the color. Is it going to be an overcast day and kind of muted? Or is it going to be a bright sunny day and very vibrant? Let's say it's going to be a bright sunny day, so I will choose a saturated blue. To recap, I chose my hue first, I chose my value second, and I chose my saturation third. Step number two and three are interchangeable, so it doesn't really matter which property you choose first. In fact, you can choose both value and saturation at the same time if you're using the wide gamut color selector, or hue and saturation together if you're using the artistic color selector. I'll fill my canvas with that blue color. I'll also show the entire canvas. Next, if I want to add a bright yellow sun in the sky, I'll select yellow for my hue, and then obviously we don't want a dark sun or a dull sun, so the color we choose needs to be bright and saturated. I'll choose a color for my sun, and then paint with the airbrush soft to add it in. Another way to quickly select a color is to use the pop-up panel. You can access this whenever the brush tool is selected by right-clicking on the canvas. The center is a color selector. That covers the basics of selecting color in Krita. We will be going more in-depth into color selection later in this course. Now let's discuss how to use undo and redo. Undo can remove brush strokes and other operations one at a time. Redo can bring them back. If I start drawing a series of lines emanating from the sun with airbrush soft, I can go to edit undo, and each time I do this, one more brush stroke will be removed until I reach my undo limit. A faster way to undo is to press Ctrl Z on your keyboard. You can redo with Ctrl Shift Z. As I mentioned, there is a limit to how many undos you can use. You can find this setting under General Miscellaneous. If I draw a lot of lines and then I try to undo them all, I'm going to eventually reach my limit. By default, the maximum is 200, but your system may only be able to handle fewer undos than that. That's enough to go back quite a ways, but if I made more than 200 lines, I wouldn't be able to go past that. I'll go ahead and set my undo limit to 32, since that will free up computer resources, and I hardly ever use more than that. Another limitation is that undo and redo information is cleared once you close a document or the Krita application. Rather than use the keyboard for undo and redo, you can also use the Wacom tablet properties to set one of your express keys or your touch ring to execute these shortcuts. Now let's discuss erasing in Krita. One way to erase brush strokes from your canvas is to select any eraser brush. There is an erasers category. I'll start with eraser soft. The erasers work similarly to a real-world eraser. Lighter pressure results in a thinner, softer erasing. Firmer pressure gradually removes everything. The eraser tool can erase any of the categories of media. Because the canvas I am painting on is blue, that is what I get when I erase. If I change the background color to something else, I'll get that instead. There are other brush variants that can be used to modify the shape and behavior of your eraser. For example, there are hard edge, square, and textured erasers. 
Just like with the brushes that apply paint, there are properties to change the brush size and opacity of the eraser. So if I want an eraser that erases slowly, I can set the opacity lower. Now the eraser takes time to build up and erase completely. It is also possible to create your own erasers that can be customized to erase with texture and other brush properties, but we will take a look at how to do that a little bit later. You can also toggle any brush to become an eraser with the keyboard shortcut of E. When you press it again, you will return to the normal brush behavior. This makes it really easy to quickly switch between erasing and painting. There's also an icon for this in the properties bar. The pen included with your drawing tablet might also have an eraser on the back end. The Wacom Pro Pen does. Once I flip the pen over and tap on the tablet, Krita will recognize it. You can select an eraser brush with the eraser end of the pen, and now when you use that end of the pen, you'll erase. Flip the pen back over to return to drawing. Krita has basically assigned two different brushes to your pen. Just like the drawing end, the eraser end of the pen is pressure sensitive. So I can erase lightly with light pressure, or I can erase more thoroughly with heavy pressure. I don't really use the eraser on my pen for erasing that often, nor do I really erase that much because there are lots of other ways you can remove marks or fix mistakes, which we will discuss later in these lessons. If your pen does not have an eraser like the Pro Pen 3, then you will have to set one of your pen buttons to erase. Now if I hold down this button on my pen, it temporarily activates the eraser tool. If I let go of the button, then I can draw again. I prefer to keep one button set to resize the brush with shift, and the other to right click, so I will set them back. One thing that is also useful about the eraser end of your pen is that you can use it to select something other than the eraser. For example, you can choose to have the eraser end select a blender or paintbrush rather than erase. Simply tap on the canvas with the eraser end, then use it to select a different brush. You can even use the eraser end to pan the canvas with spacebar, and change the brush size while holding shift. I'll leave it up to you to decide whether you prefer to blend or erase with your eraser end. I blend more than I erase, so I'll reserve it for blending. The eraser tool can be fully customized with various brush properties. You can choose from a wide range of different brush tips, and you can add spacing and other properties. Now this is a more interesting looking eraser. I'd of course want to save this custom eraser if I want to keep it, but we'll look at how to do that later in this course. Next, let's take a look at how to sample colors. I'll go to File Open and I will load the sampling template. You can find these in the Artwork and Templates folder in the Course Resource Files. A simple way to keep your colors consistent throughout your artwork is to sample colors that have already been applied to your canvas. To do that, you can select the Sample Color tool and then click on a color on screen to activate it in the color selector. If I sample a color and then select a brush like the Basic 5 Size Opacity Paintbrush, I am able to paint with the sampled color. Rather than selecting the Sample Color tool, with the Brush tool selected, you can activate the Sample Color tool at any time by holding down Alt on your keyboard. By default, Control is the keyboard shortcut for this, but I have changed it since most other art apps use Alt. If you didn't install my custom keyboard shortcuts, you can change this manually or leave it set to Control. When you release the shortcut, you will return to the brush tool. That's really the quickest and easiest way to sample color while you're painting. If you prefer, you can also activate the sample color tool using an express key or a button on your pen. By default, the sample size is one pixel, so occasionally the color you get may not be what you expect, especially if you're sampling on a busy image. These pixels are very small and very close together, so it's difficult to pick the same color twice. It is possible to sample a larger area to average the colors, but we will discuss how to do that a little bit later. When sampling, you get a preview of the sampled color in a swatch next to your cursor. Now let's move on to discuss some of the basics of saving your artwork. I'll make some modern art, and let's say that I want to save this. I'll go to the file menu and I can choose either save or save as. I prefer to use save as because it allows me to save iterations of my work, rather than save over a single document. There is a function for iterative saving in Krita, but I like to just save iterations manually. After choosing Save, I'll select a location where I'll be able to find this file. Then I'll give my file a name. I'm going to call it Test Save, and then I'll choose a file format. The default file format for Krita is .kra, and it will preserve any proprietary Krita layers or features. It's recommended that you save the original copies of your artwork as Krita.kra to ensure full compatibility. 
That's not to say you cannot work between Krita and Photoshop or other art applications using the cross-compatible PSD file format, because you can. But be aware that there are certain layer features that are proprietary to Krita and are not compatible with the PSD file format. You also have the option of saving as PNG, JPEG, TIFF, and tons of other formats. Some of these formats can be very helpful for printing or posting on the web, but we will come back to that. What's important is that you always save your original working file as a layered format, such as Krita KRA, Photoshop PSD, or TIFF. The other file formats will flatten your image and discard the individual layers. We haven't really talked very much about the importance of layers, but you'll be using them a lot later in the course. In addition to saving your original copy, you may also want to create additional copies of your work in other formats and sizes. A quick way to do this is to select Export rather than Save. If you're planning to print your work, saving as a TIFF will give you the highest image quality while preserving the layers in your image. I've already saved my original as a KRA, so now I'll export to save a copy as a TIFF and name it Test Save Print. If you're saving your artwork to the web, then you'll want to choose PNG, JPEG, or possibly WebP. Personally, I prefer PNG because it uses lossless compression, meaning that it's not going to degrade the quality of your image in order to make the file size smaller. PNG also supports transparent backgrounds. The JPEG format will produce a smaller file size, but it may degrade the quality of your image by throwing away some image and color details. JPEG does not support background transparency and will fill the background with white, so only use JPEG if you must. Otherwise, choose PNG. I'll select the PNG format and I'll name the file Test Save Web. Then I'll save it. When saving copies, you may also want to resize your image, but we'll discuss how to do that later in this course. If I look in the folder where I saved those images, I have my original copy in KRA format, which preserves the layers and the original detail of my artwork. Then I have a high quality TIFF that I can print from and a PNG that I can post to the web. I'll return to Krita. In my opinion, the best way to save is to use iterative saving. Iterative saving is the process of saving sequential copies of your artwork. This can be a great way to minimize risk while painting because you'll always have an older version to go back to if you make a major mistake. It's also useful to show the progress of a painting. There is a save incremental version function in Krita which will automatically add a number to the file name each time you save, but to do it manually, just choose save as and then add a number or other type of descriptive label. Krita does offer an autosave feature. The options can be found in general file handling. You can change the frequency and quantity of saves, or deactivate it altogether. You can even unhide the autosave files from your file explorer if you like. Organizing your files is an essential habit to adopt, especially if you create artwork. Without proper organization, it can be easy for you to lose your work due to forgetting where it was saved, accidental deletion, or overwriting. To avoid this, it's best to stay organized from the start, because trying to sort through a disorganized collection of artwork later will be time-consuming and tedious. Create a folder or select a hard drive that's dedicated to your artwork. If it helps, create subfolders by year or month, and then by project name. What's important here is that you're able to look in this folder and find a specific painting very easily based on the name and date. To learn more about file organization, I have a reference video you can watch. Those were some of the basic functions and skills you'll be learning in Krita. In our next lesson, we will be exploring what we can do with the tools and some of their controls in the tool options.